So I think the participants have already signed in quite substantially. Uh, it's 12 noon and I would like to start on time. I'm trying to keep this uh, series of webinar to time and uh, I think everyone has is working very hard and uh, it's a limited uh, timing to this kind of CME program. This will be a quite interactive program. Uh, APSC is uh, committed to launch a series of uh, webinars, CME based webinars on um, a variety of topics uh, predominantly focused on coronary heart disease. Today we are going to talk about STEMI care during COVID-19 times. Uh, this webinar will last to 1 p.m. but if the discussion is very exciting and interactive, we may extend based on uh, the participants' interests. The meeting is endorsed by IACP. The representation will be from Professor Koji, Singapore Cardiac Society, and this uh, series of webinars is in collaboration with AstraZeneca. So um, with me, this is uh, uh, people on the panel today. So I'm chairing and moderating. It gives me great pleasure again to moderate among a lot of friends. We have three speakers, Professor Shi Kai, Professor Derek Chu, uh, and Dr. Lo Jiaxin, and a series of panelists, as you can see. A bit about myself, I'm from Singapore. I'm a practicing interventional cardiologist, the current president of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology based out of the National Heart Center, Singapore. Our first speaker of the day will be Professor Shi Kai. He is the right-hand man of uh, Professor Han Yaling at Shenyang Northern uh, Hospital in China. And uh, he's going to share with us the initial experience uh, coming out of China in overcoming COVID-19, especially for STEMI care. Professor Derek Chu is also a good friend from Matthew Flinders, uh, fellow and professor in cardiology from Adelaide, Australia. He has been involved in quite a few of the APSE consensus recommendation. Today, he'll focus a discussion of his talk tailored to the questions that you ask, and uh, he's pointed the uh, guidance based on APSE consensus on uh, antithrombotic management for ACS patients. Dr. Lo Jason is a consultant in infectious disease, and uh, I asked him right at the end to give the cardiologists across the region a little bit of update on what Singapore is doing and the review on the current state of the art in terms of COVID uh, proven therapies. Panelists uh, across the region, as you can see, Dr. Mahmoud is from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi from the UAE. Professor Hello. Junia Eko is from Tokyo. Uh, Professor Koji sorry, is from sorry, Kyoto. Uh, Professor Kwang is from Vietnam, Hanoi, Bak Mai Hospital. Dr. Alan Fong is from Sarawak General Hospital, our good friend there. And of course, another of uh, good friend is from uh, Haripan Kita, Dr. Donny uh, Furman from Indonesia. So we got quite a lot of faculty. I, any questions that you may want to direct, uh, we can uh, focus the Q&A to the faculty that you're keen to ask the question to. A bit of a disclaimer here, <coughs> the content of this webinar is copyrighted by APSC and should not be distributed without the prior permission. The views and opinion in this webinar express are those of the faculty members, not necessarily endorsed by APSC, as we know that there's a lot of evidence-free uh, zone and data uh, during this COVID-19 period. The content will be live streamed in Rutherford Medicine and on our APSC Facebook page and subsequently posted as well, the recorded event. And for our Singapore participants, if you have been registered and provided your MCR number, CME points will be awarded to you if you fulfill the minimum one hour requirement. If you hang on to the call for one hour, you will get your CME point. So uh, thank you very much um, for that. For Please, I'm, I'm sure we are used to doing Zoom. At the end, uh, please put in your questions uh, and send. Then we'll collate them. <clears throat> I'm going to take another five minutes just to go through and give a lay of the land regarding care plan in COVID uh, prime time. I gave this lecture early on in April, actually in early part of April in the transcontinental webinar organized uh, out of Luzon, Switzerland by Eric Eckhout. And um, I was asked to give this slide. And this slide, as you see, is on March 30th. In March 30th, we saw US doubling every two days in terms of COVID-19 numbers, likewise Italy. And during the early part, late part of March, Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, South Korea were doing relatively well with low numbers. 
And what everyone tried to do is to flatten the COVID curve and therefore limit the collateral uh, cardiovascular damage because as the resources get dwindled and shunted towards COVID-19 management, our cardiology elective and uh, beds get truncated. Singapore now is at a partial lockdown for the fourth week extended to eight. There's new law for social distancing and uh, requ uh, requisition of resources act, which allows government to take in resources to manage COVID-19. That was end March. This is 1st May. As of 1st May, we have jumped to 3 million total cases, 1.5, 1.4 each in North America and Europe. Asia were about half a million, but not too sure whether the figures are really quite accurate because of testing. As you can see, Singapore now from 1,000 cases in end March is now 17,000 cases, the highest in Southeast Asia. Um, and Malaysia at 6,000, Philippines at 8,000, Indonesia at 10,000. Australia is coming out of a lockdown at 6,000. But uh, as you can see, the number below, maybe the slide is uh, very small in fonts. The test per million population, Malaysia is 5,000. Philippines is 1,000. Indonesia is 395 per million population tested. Singapore is running at 25,000 per million population. Likewise, Australia is at 23,000. Over and beyond the flattening of the curve that we're trying to do and learn from countries like China, how they did it. Singapore, Japan is still seeing some search going on. United States, Italy is plateauing off. Over and beyond the consideration in death and numbers, there's a huge economic toll. I think Singapore has uh, pushed out $60 billion this year, 12% of GDP just to tackle COVID related issues. So there's also a huge economic hardship across the countries. And you can see US doubling every two to three days initially, Korea, uh, Japan flatten up, but there's a huge fear of resurgence. Singapore initially flat, but now surging. And uh, flattening the curve is what we all need to do, but not just as an individual country level, I would say. It doesn't matter what Singapore does if Jakarta or Indonesia doesn't do likewise and get the situation under control because this thing will go round and round, I would think. So we need to not just do it um, as a country level, we need to do it across the region and uh, as a combined effort. So again, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank everyone for joining us for this exciting webinar and uh, thank our sponsors, Asher Zeneca. So the circuit breaker will not break our spirits. So for the first talk, we'll have uh, Professor Shi Kai come on uh, to give us his uh, lecture. Professor Sikai, please. So we'll share his talk now. Uh, dear Professor uh, Jack Tan, our friends from Asia, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to uh, attend the APIC webinar series about COVID-19 pandemic. Today, uh, my topic is about the sharing of best practice from China, consideration and change to ACS workflow in response to COVID pandemic. I mainly focus on Chinese Society of Cardiology Expert Consensus on behalf of Professor Han Yaling, the President of Chinese Society of Cardiology. So this is the situation in China about COVID-19. We can clearly see the peak of the patient number of COVID-19 was in middle of February. Later, the situation in China became better and better. And today, we have only less than 1,000 patients with COVID-19 in China. The total uh, confirmed case number uh, was more than 80,000 and the deaths is more than 4,000. And we all know the Wuhan city, the epicenter of COVID-19 was locked down on January 23rd. And more than 40,000 medical staff were sent to Wuhan city or province of Hubei to fight COVID-19. At that time, we really don't know how to treat this disease. Especially for the cardiologists, we don't know what happened to the patient with cardiovascular disease. In order to guide the cardiologists to fight COVID-19, Professor Han Yaling organized more than 100 experts, mainly from Chinese Society of Cardiology, uh, to arrive this uh, CIC expert consensus on principle of clinical management of patients with severe emergent cardiovascular disease during the COVID-19 epidemic. 
Uh, firstly, the, the manuscript was published uh, on Chinese Journal of Cardiology on February uh, 13, and then later the English version of this consensus were published uh, in circulation on March 28. This is the general principle of this consensus. First, the epidemic control was the first priority. Uh, second, once the patient arrived in the hospital, risk assessment should be carried out as soon as possible. And for all patients with cardiovascular disease, conservative medical therapy should be first run uh, therapy uh, in those patients. And in order to limit the effects between uh, patients and medical staff, uh, six measures to be carried out uh, to prevent cross uh, infections. Uh, very important things is to uh, assess the risk, both the risk of COVID-19 and the risk of cardiovascular disease. We should balance the risk of cross infection and the benefit of treatment, especially the benefits of the procedure for the patients with cardiovascular disease. And finally, comprehensive considerations should be made to differentiate the diagnosis because we know dyspnea, this kind of symptom can be caused by cardiovascular disease or caused by the critical COVID 19 infection. So, personal protective equipment uh, were very important during this pandemic. At the beginning of the outbreak in China, uh, we were also sort of uh, PPE. And later, the situation is getting better. And uh, the protection of both the medical staff and patients were very important. Uh, this algorithm showed the uh, management of critical cardiovascular disease in regions with high incidence of COVID-19, mainly in Hubei province and mainly in, uh, especially in the Wuhan city. Uh, the hospitals in uh, Wuhan or other provinces, the hospital can be divided into two types of uh, one is uh, COVID-19 designated hospital, the other is a non-designated hospital. All the patients who have been uh, diagnosed as confirmed or suspected cases of COVID-19 should be sent to COVID-19 designated hospital. Uh, for the suspected cases, single room should be used. And all those patients, the medical therapy should be first line treatment in those patients. Uh, but if they have a, a emergent invasive intervention criteria, uh, they should receive the invasive procedure or operations. The medical staff should have third grade protection and the cat lab should be equipped with an active pressure ventilation. If they did not uh, uh, reach the emergent invasive intervention criteria, and the uh, medical treatment should be continued, and the uh, elective invasive intervention uh, should be carried out in the future. Uh, for the patients who arrive in non designated hospital, the lung CT scan and the nuclear assay test should be carried out as soon as possible. And once the patients was diagnosed as confirmed or suspected cases, this should be sent to the COVID-19 designated hospital. Uh, if they have been ruled out as a COVID-19, routine treatment in uh, non-designated hospital should be uh, uh, carried out, and the, uh, the treatment should be uh, guided by the guideline. And uh, in the regions outside the Hubei province, uh, usually, uh, those areas were with a uh, low incidence of COVID-19. So for those patients, if they have a fever, this would be sent to fever clinic. If not, this would be sent to emergency department. After COVID-19 expert panel discussion, the patients can be divided into three uh, classes. Uh, can be divided into three uh, types of patients. The first is the confirm or suspect cases. Those patients should be sent to designated hospital as soon as possible. And if the patient has been ruled out as a COVID-19 patients, routine uh, treatment uh, according to guidelines should be uh, taken for these patients. And uh, importantly, if patients have fever, but they have no epidemiology history traveling to Wuhan, 
and the CT scan saw something like uh, the manufacturing of the COVID-19. Those faces can be defined as uh, patients cannot be excluded temporarily. We should be careful about those patients. And then for those patients, single rooms should be used to isolate them, and metal swabs should have second-grade protection. Uh, we should uh, observe the clinical manifestation in those patients and repeat line CT scan and nuclear cell test and reach a final diagnosis as soon as possible. So this slide shows the list of patients with severe uh, emergent cardiovascular disease. Those patients should be admitted to hospital and be treated uh, by the conservative medical uh, treatment at the beginning, uh, including the patients with STEMI, uh, whom thrombolytic therapy is indicated. And the STEMI patients arrive in hospital beyond the window of time for revascularization, but still have symptoms, IT elevation, or myocardial infarction related mechanical complications. And high-risk non-STEMI ACS patients and the patients with aortic dissection, acute pulmonary embolization, and acute exacerbation of heart failure and hypertension. But if the patients have following situations, they should be sent to cancer lab of operation room to receive receive procedures, uh, including acute STEMI with hemodynamic instability or non-STEMI indicated for urgent uh, revascularization, mainly the high, very high risk non-STEMI patients, and the aortic dissection with complications, and the uh, brandy arrhythmia uh, should be treated by uh, permanent uh, pacemaker and the pulmonary embolism who should be sent to Catalan to receive transcatheter low dose thrombolysis in pulmonary uh, arteries. But not all patients should be received the procedure uh, immediately. They have to meet such kind of criteria. First, uh, they have one of the emergency uh, mentioned above and the, the patients should be treated in the hospital designated for COVID-19. And the cancer lab should have been equipped with negative pressure ventilation. And medical staff should have third-grade protection equipment and approved by the local health commission. Once the patients decide to be treated by invasive procedure, uh, in hospital transport, plans should be made as soon as possible to minimize the delay of the in hospital transfer to save to save time to save the myocardium uh, in patients in, in STEMI, uh, with STEMI, uh, for example. And also, the protection in cancer life is very important. Uh, for patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 undergoing emergent cardiovascular intervention procedures, pre-established plan for COVID-19 should be initiated. Different hospitals have different plans, but such kind of plans should be made previously. And this should include all aspects of perioperative preparation and the comprehensive perioperative management of the patients, operators, environment, disinfection, sterilization, emergency supplies, equipment, and the consumables. Also, the consensus include other suggestions, optimization laboratory infection items, reasonable transfer between hospitals, telemedicines, psychological interventions. I don't want to go through all those uh, because of the time limit. I only want to mention referral between hospitals. Uh, in the consensus, uh, we recommend, that in principle, patients with severe emergent cardiovascular disease who have been ruled out for COVID-19 should be treated locally. For the confirmed or suspected COVID-19 patients with critical cardiovascular diseases should be transferred immediately to a COVID-19 designated hospital for isolation and uh, uh, further treatment. For a summary, the COVID-19 outbreak has substantially increased the difficulty of treating patients with severe emergent cardiovascular disease 
Individualized diagnosis and treatment measures tailored to special local epidemic situations should be uh, developed. Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Prof. Shikai. That was excellent. I know I only gave you 10 minutes. It's a very difficult uh, lecture to give in uh, 10 minutes. So there are some actually very interesting Q&A questions that has popped up. Uh, first, I'd like to address some of the questions to the faculty regarding the observation and the learning points coming out from China. Um, as you see, we, we have a lot to learn from China, which were, was a country that first encountered uh, COVID-19 with a lot of unknowns. But as you can see, they locked down the city very early on in January. And this observation about COVID uh, positive versus non-COVID positive hospitals, is that widely practiced across the region? Is this the same in Japan, for example, Dr. Eiko? Is your hospital, are there hospitals uh, dedicated to COVID no, only uh, and some not? No, uh, we haven't uh, have that such a designation such as a COVID positive only or COVID negative only. So we are seeing patients uh, with COVID positive as well as COVID neg negative. And, so uh, you, you, you manage everyone, you don't transfer COVID patients to any exactly, other hospital? Exactly. The, the good thing is that prevalence of COVID is still low in Japan. So uh, we haven't seen any cases with uh, STEMI patients with COVID positive or COVID suspected pa uh, patients. So um, that's the difference uh, between uh, China who experienced uh, many cases of COVID versus uh, uh, Japan, uh, which uh, uh, whose uh, prevalence of COVID is how about Malaysia, Alan? Is there a segregation in hospital for COVID positive? You're muted, Alan. So in Malaysia, some hospitals are designated COVID hospitals, but uh, in my state of Sarawak, uh, there are no fully designated uh, COVID hospitals. There are four hybrid hospitals uh, to manage COVID and non-COVID cases, um, but in uh, the heart center where I primarily work in is a supporting hospital, i.e. a non-COVID designated hospital. So these are some of the challenges we have in the APSC region uh, where there are not enough just designated COVID hospitals. So I think China is very lucky where you have designated COVID hospitals that you can quickly do CT scans very rapidly to screen uh, and also PCR which you can do very rapidly uh, which is a uh, uh, quite a challenge for mo most of us in uh, the other parts of the APSC. So thanks, thanks for that. Uh, maybe I'll get uh, Derek to answer, Derek and Donnie actually. This recommendation about having a negative pressure cath lab to do a uh, suspect or positive COVID patients. Uh, do you have this uh, facility in Australia though? Do you have a dedicated negative pressure cath lab, Derek? So in Australia, we, we don't. I mean, there might be occasionally we've had um, some uh, new installations where there have been hybrid labs, um, but the, that's by far the most uncommon. Uh, you know, I can only think of one or two hospitals that might actually have a negative pressure lab to be able to do that in. So we in our institution actually had to designate a cath lab that was non-negative pressure. Um, and there's an extensive, as you know, donning and doffing um, PPE procedure, and then extensive cleaning after that. Um, it's, it's, you know, obviously a, a significant um, impact to the, uh, to the way you facilitate um, delivering invasive services. Um, and so many of the hospitals, as a response to that requirement, needed to um, have, have banned all elective work and have uh, so across the country, there was a banning of all elective work so that we could actually have more capacity to deliver um, uh, urgent work at a slower pace, if you, if you know what I mean. Just yeah. to answer your other question, though, in Australia, there, there was a significant demarcating of COVID hospital and non-COVID hospital um, uh, um, designations. So it meant that... Um, because Australia is a big country with lots of transfer between institutions, one of the things that has become a, an issue, if you like, is clarity of the patient's COVID status before planning of, of um, transfer, even though we've actually not seen all that much COVID um, around. Sure. Donny, is there a negative pressure cath lab in Karibankita? Uh, 
No, no, no. We, we don't have a uh, jack, but uh, we have a uh, one designated uh, cat lab, room number five. Actually, it's a little bit separated from the other from the other labs. We have six labs, so the this one is uh, separated. But uh, we don't have a negative cat lab. But uh, this cat lab is, uh, you know, very strict in uh, how to disinfecting something like that. So we don't have a negative cat lab. Dr. Mahmoud, uh, in UAE, uh, if you don't have a negative pressure cat lab, what do you do? So we we were we have a negative pressure cat lab. We have, have one that we were able to convert, and <laughs> <laughs> second we weren't. And yeah. we have a similar. We've switched to mostly a COVID and a non-COVID hospitals. We don't sure. transfer in between, but where most cases from the government sector and positive cases are directed to the COVID hospitals. But we're a non-COVID hospital, but you know we have 150 COVID cases in the hospital now, so it's it doesn't it doesn't protect us, and we don't transfer them out if they come in. So maybe I'd like to ask our ID physician because you know this call is about STEMI care, and this is always a concern that a lot of people raise about positive pressure care flag. Dr. Lo, uh, what is the real risk of a positive pressure care flag in terms of staff risk? Uh, and I, some yeah, of my China colleagues, pressure, they even right? say they switch off the positive pressure in the OT to do COVID positive patients. Uh, they turn off the positive pressure. Means there's no pressure, it's just hot. Yeah. Um, is Dr. Lo, um, can, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so the procedures are divided generally into aerosol generating and non-aerosol generating procedures. And as far as I understand, cath procedures are non-aerosol generating. Uh, short of the possibility of needing to emergently intubate somebody in a cath lab, generally for non-cath, non-AGP, um, it's you actually don't need negative pressure if, if yeah that's apparently what's the, that's the, what the guidelines say and if you if you t take the adequate precaution everybody I'm sure you're in an N95 with mask and shield it should be quite safe so uh, right now in so, Singapore we are not doing a negative pressure cath labs are we Jack? Uh, no, we, we don't have a negative pressure. Well, we, don't have. <laughs> yeah, we don't have. No, no not that I'm aware of. So we have designated cath lab, so called uh, designated dirty cath lab, but not a negative pressure cath lab. And uh, I'm not too sure if switching off the uh, positive pressure is the way forward for us. So we have practiced like what you advise and say that we full protection. We take it as the last case and we do a full cleaning afterwards. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. We try to get as many people out of the lab uh, as possible when uh, when the the case is going on. Um, can I then ask but about this uh, STEM, STEMI uh, 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 risk though? There's a question coming on and based uh, on the data that we have, when we have patients with COVID-19 and cardiac manifestation, is it a type 1 plug rupture or is it a spontaneous is a type 2 MI, is a type 1 MI, is it coronary artery spontaneous thrombosis, especially in the younger patients with no risk factors? So maybe this one I'll get Dr. Shikai to enlighten us in the initial experience when they see MI in COVID positive patients. Is it really a plug rupture MI or is it uh, in the sick COVID patients a spontaneous arterial thrombosis or type 2 MI or MI without coronary artery disease? Yeah, uh, I think most uh, case uh, for the COVID-19 patients, the MI should be belongs to the type 2 uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, I think uh, the myocardial injury in the COVID-19 patients, uh, the rate is, is very high. Uh, and also many studies, uh, both from China and other countries, so if the patients had uh, myocardial injury, the mortality rate uh, are very high for those patients compared with those patients without myocardial injury. Uh, so I think uh, we should be careful. But uh, in terms of the myocarditis caused by COVID-19, from the Chinese experience, there are not so much uh, a rate of uh, cardio, uh, myocardial, myocarditis caused by COVID-19, uh, at least in China, in the uh, CCU in Wuhan. Uh, uh, we don't uh, find many uh, severe myocarditis caused by COVID-19. Most are patients with myocardial injury. Most of them has a history of cardiovascular disease. For example, the
the coronary artery disease, hypertension, a failure of something. So we should be careful about the patient's uh, myocardial injury. If they have, we have to treat them, very, uh, we have to uh, treat their heart carefully. So there was a question from the audience as well regarding initially, I saw a letter coming out from Wuhan Hospital saying that they delay even a STEMI case to do a COVID test, a rapid test before deciding whether to medically treat them or even thrombolize them versus sending them to cath lab. Are we still doing the same in China? Do they need a COVID swab test negativity before they come to the cath lab? If they're walking from the street with a STEMI or they are just treated as per normal? Uh, I think the situation in Wuhan and the other parts of China is, is totally different because I think uh, around the half to uh, three quarters of COVID-19 patients uh, were located in Wuhan. Uh, for the other part, I think the most area is the region with low incidence of COVID-19. Uh, so for the Wuhan uh, city, I think uh, because I, I, I don't see if, if a patient have a STEMI, uh, at the beginning of the break, at least, the time uh, before the uh, COVID-19 test result can be, can be, can be solved, uh, it take a long time. For the, so for the STEMI patients, uh, just as I said in the consensus, uh, thrombolysis therapy is the first line uh, therapy for those patients. So uh, I think uh, most of the cases, uh, like they, if they have no result of COVID-19 test, uh, first line therapy should be uh, thrombolytic uh, therapy for those patients. Derek, you have a comment? No. So um, in Australia, we debated this a lot. Obviously, it depends very much on the propensity for thrombolysis versus primary PCI. And you can imagine that most of the big cities in Australia all are almost 90, um, 99% primary PCI. I have a few cardiologists who don't know how to spell thrombolysis nowadays. So, <laughs> so um, we actually did produce some guidelines that were permissive about the use of fibrinolysis um, and needed to stipulate in those exactly the doses and the use of the ancillary therapies, which we can go into at another time. But, um, but certainly uh, in patients where, um, where uh, there was we, we were preparing for a lack of staff and preparing for a lack of access to cath labs. Uh, and so um, several institutions had already made the decision to switch to fibrinolysis as first line agent. The other issue that um, I thought is worth mentioning about the aerosolizing procedures is that we made a very big um, issue around uh, making decisions about patients' airways and, uh, and um, uh, and respiratory status before actually coming into the cath lab. And so, in fact, because of that issue of um, an uncontrolled environment where you might need to intubate a patient, um, we kind of made a recommendation that you should um, consider intubation and stabilization of the airway early in patients who might be going into cardiogenic shock or acute pulmonary edema in the context of an ACS. Much better to do it in a controlled environment in the ICU or, or in a resus bay of an emergency department before transfer to the cath lab than trying to do it with an II floating around the head of the patient. So, um, so that was sort of highlighted early in the, in the process as well. Thanks, um, thanks for that. Um, how about Vietnam, uh, Dr. Kwong? Is it thrombolysis or, because I think in Vietnam you got the COVID situation quite under control. Have you switched out of your PCI protocol to cater to thrombolysis though? So actually, so when the uh, pandemic is appear, uh, the uh, government asked us to, uh, to modify the protocol to save the human resource and also uh, to, uh, for the future pandemic. So actually, we, we changed the protocol into the thrombolysis. However, now when the, uh, the uh, incident is uh, low, so it become like depend on the local hospital. Uh, if the uh, local hospital um, have a very low incident in, in the province with a very low incident of the COVID-19 and then they can choose the primary PCR. 
Uh, in my institute, we uh, uh, usually we uh, we just wait about a few hours, usually like four to six hours, to have a COVID test before we uh, we jump into the COVID. Only for in very uh, emergency case and. We put the every people in the full equipment to protect them and to treat it at the treated uh, positive COVID case. However, so far no case positive in my institute. No case is good. Yeah, just uh, keep on having no case. Um, I, I there's a question from the audience uh, about what you mean by the level of protection. Is um, when you're doing suspect cases, is it N95? Uh, with full gowning, face shield enough, or do you need PAPR? Dr. Eko from Japan, is what, what is the level of protection that is sufficient for a suspect or positive case? For well, suspected cases, we are wearing a N95 and surgical mask, and uh, we are wearing uh, eye protection as well. And N95, so correct me if I'm wrong, the surgical mask is outside N95 or inside? Yeah. <laughs> okay, just, just not a trick question. N95 so. inside and yeah, yeah okay. outside surgical mask. And we are wearing uh, eye protection as well. And okay, Dr. Shikai, what is the practice in China in the cath lab? Yeah, uh, if the faces have been ruled out uh, as COVID-19, we just do as zero. We call it uh, uh, first grade protection. Uh, but the patient uh, uh, is diagnosed as a confirmed or suspected mm -hmm. case, which is the uh, same, the third grade uh, protection, the highest survival. So we have, um, also we have the uh, N95 and uh, the IR protect protection. Yeah, uh, also, yeah. yeah. Uh, very strict uh, protection should be used. So Dr. Lo, this is very interesting uh, coming from Japan, N95 and surgical masks. <laughs> well, what is the recommendation from ID? You have the last word. Is it better to just go to a PAPR or is that? Uh, okay, so the N95 and surgical masks, of, of course, if you go by guidelines strictly, they recommend either N95 or if your N95 fitting is poor, PAPR. I. I I think one of the reasons why people do double layer, because in, in more contagious outbreaks like Ebola, every piece of protection is double layered, right? So there's the outer layer and the inner layer. Maybe it's extrapolated from that concept because if you wear an N95 and then when you, in between patients, you can just change the surgical mask. Uh, um, I don't know whether Professor Junior, is it extrapolated from that kind of thinking? Yes, because look, yes, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so I can understand where I'm coming from, yeah. So, but it hasn't reached um, proper guideline recommendation, of course, uh, because I, I think also if that's the case, we have probably not enough masks, we'll be double the amount of production because, <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think the only thing is maybe you're intubating, you don't want to put your hands and then touch and remove an N95 if you get splashed. So maybe just changing surgical mask may make sense. Yeah. There's of yeah. course a face shield. So you save an N95 that way. So something yeah. like that. Okay. So um, I, we're going to take to the next lecture now with uh, Professor Derek Chu sharing with us and contextualizing some of the APSC guidelines with regards to the antithrombotic management of ACS patient, whether it can be adapted during this COVID time, what needs to be changed, what needs to be adapted. So we ask... Uh, Dr. Chu to share his slides. So um, I might try and share these. Let me see if I can share the screen. So uh, the topic I was um, uh, was originally asked to present was uh, this topic. Can you? S are my slides presenting? Yes. You want to go to the slideshow? Yep. Okay. So um, we were going to talk about P2Y12 inhibitors and, and escalation and de-escalation, but I might skip through just um, actually what I thought I just quickly change things to to um, talk a bit about what was recommended around um, STEMI and ACS care in uh, in patients um, in the Australian Cardiac Society consensus statements. So we all know that um, about seven percent of the patients who present with um, uh, who have COVID-19 will have ECG changes. And, and we've all seen the reports of STEMI mimics. Obviously there are also ventricular arrhythmias um, uh, 
Dr. G has um, mentioned very much about the myocardial injury and uh, and obviously myocarditis as well. And you know, it's very important, obviously, to consider all these diagnostic possibilities before one progresses to the cath lab. Um, it really is important to recognize that, um, unfortunately, coriangiography is still probably necessary to differentiate STEMI from myocarditis and, and also stress cardiomyopathy or Takotsubo. So, um, uh, sorry about the slide being very dense, but I thought I would just quickly jump through some of the things. In, in Australia, we have been making recommendations about the low-risk patient who might progress straight to the cath lab versus higher-risk patients, or we had, as I mentioned earlier, um, considered patients um, who, uh, who are arriving at hospitals who might have depleted um, clinical staff. So um, obviously, if the staff become um, affected, then, then the integrity of our primary PCI services would be um, diminished. And there was an increased likelihood that people would um, need um, uh, fibrinolysis. As I mentioned earlier, the familiarity with fibrinolysis in our hospitals has diminished over the years. And so just moving to the, um, to the end, we would, we would recommend that you still try and deliver fibrinolysis within 30 minutes of um, door to balloon time, uh, sorry, door to lysis time, or door to needle time. Um, that uh, we recommend single dose weight adjusted boluses of TNK, but in patients over the age of 75, we would, um, we would uh, recommend the use of TNK um, with, at half dose and not use the loading dose of clopidogrel. Um, you will see in the most recent updated um, APSC guidelines on the use of P2Y12 inhibitors that we are recommending that people can swap from, uh, from clopidogrel to ticagrelor um, after their fibrinolysis, after eight hours after their fibrinolysis. But in the COVID-19 patient, actually, we don't have any evidence for what to do in this. And our recommendation in Australia, at least, was to, to withhold that. Um, again, given the prothrombotic rate of the, um, uh, in these patients, um, the recommendation of use of, of anoxaparin I would think at the moment, even though we don't have any prospective data and I certainly would welcome any thoughts from China, but we would not recommend any change to the dosing of enoxaparin, um, uh, withholding the, um, uh, the bolus in, in those of uh, old age group um, and continuing with subcut BD um, doses of this. So other things that um, we should consider in the STEMI um, population of patients that, that, were, um, that were considered in our document in Australia. So, um, so we should be very careful about who we bring to the cath lab, obviously. And, and you know, we, um, in those patients with, um, who have already been thrombolyzed and who have ongoing um, symptoms in ECG changes that have been refractory to fibrinolysis, we would recommend um, bringing to the cath lab. Furthermore, those with hemodynamic instability, and then those obviously with large um, uh, uh, STEMI um, territories, so left main LAD type or very large inferior infarcts. The consideration was also made about, the, um, about patients who were unwell from, um, from ARDS, who may have, um, have uh, you know, suggested STEMI-type um, criteria. Those should really not be brought to the cath lab uh, you know, without careful consideration from a multidisciplinary team um, just to make decisions about whether or not um, these, uh, that this therapy was likely to provide a benefit. And it was also raised as a possibility, I'm not sure the access to CTCA in many parts of Asia, but um, in patients in, um, in Australia, it was considered that CTCA might be something we might consider as, uh, as a way of differentiating whether or not there was patent coronary vessels versus, versus a STEMI. And you know, we might use that more judiciously in the patients with very few risk factors and, and low suspicion. Um, Jack, do I have a bit more time just to talk about the non-STEMI and unstable angina population? Maybe we use it as a Q&A, then maybe you can flash a slide as we discuss. There's a sure. question popping out uh, asking 
uh, you to send them the Australian guidelines actually, since there's a practitioner from Australia asking you, uh, Son Tan. And there's a question that was quite interesting, which is in the COVID-19 patients, there's an observation that there's some thrombocytopenia. So if the platelet count drops below 100, what, what, do you have any adjustment to the guidelines for if they have ACS, they receive a stent and um, they get COVID-19? So certainly we don't know much about this group and it's, um, our experience, if you like, is drawn a little bit from the thrombocytopenia patients who, um, who, you know, for many years, um, we would have, you know, the problem of thrombocytopenia in those patients receiving uh, 2B3 inhibitors or, um, or uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So again, in this situation, we're not completely clear what the mechanism of it is and whether or not it's a, a, a consumptive coagulopathy or whether or not um, the, the um, you know, what, what the actual mechanism of it, it, it is, it's likely that it might be immune mediated, of, co of course, as well. So um, the problem that we've seen in other settings and other viral illnesses is that these patients are actually not necessarily um, prone to much more bleeding, but they're actually slightly more pro-thrombotic. Um, and so uh, certainly in the consumptive cardiopathy, um, uh, situation, it's a challenging issue because they obviously bleed at, in, in, and, and thrombose at the same time. Um, so maybe I can I'm, ask uh, Professor Shikai to jump in here to give his comment about in a patient with thrombocytopenia, do you adjust the DAT therapy for a patient who require it for ACS management? Do you still use Ticagalor as a first choice therapy for post stenting or is it Copidogrel if they are thrombocytopenic? Then after that, I'll get Professor Koji to comment as well. Professor well, Shikai, do you have any advice for the group that you manage? Do you change? Are you still using Ticagalor if the plate count is low? Uh, I think uh, I will not change. I still use it uh, because I have to uh, balance if the patient is a uh, uh, high risk, really high risk bleeding patients or not. So if they are not high risk bleeders, you would still continue to use Ticagalor? Yeah, yeah, I, I will prefer, prefer to continue. Even if the player count is like 80, 90, is, that's your first choice preference, right? Is there a lower limit where you would consider dropping DAPT or changing agents or there's no lower limit? What is uh, your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, for the... Uh, for, we have also Chinese uh, consensus uh, for recovery uh, or DAPT if the uh, plat uh, lead is very very low, we will use the single uh, uh, anti therapy. I think in the Chinese uh, VTE consensus, the number given was 50,000. Professor Koji, do you have any comments about whether it's worthwhile switching agents in thrombocytopenic COVID patients? Professor yes, Koji, yeah. you're muted. Yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. Thrombolysis is a very nice option, but uh, I agree with to make a clear diagnosis of uh, uh, myocardial infection due to coronary artery thrombosis uh, because there is a possibility of small coronary artery disease or myocardial disease. There are so many uh, possibilities. Uh, there is a report from New England Journal of Medicine that out of 18 cases, the coronary artery occlusion was only obs observed in eight cases, so less than half. So more than half of them are not due to the coronary artery thrombus. So the thrombolysis will be the very nice option, but uh, we need to confirm that the uh, coronary artery thrombus by uh, using CTCA, coronary CT may be also useful. And also, uh, I very uh, much agree with use of low molecular heparin after the thrombolysis. Uh, you showed in the uh, first slide, it's very nice choices rather than antiplatelet because the coagulability is so much increased in COVID-19 patients. There are so many clots, not, not only in the coronary artery, but also in the pulmonary artery. 
So that led to the pulmonary embolism, which may be the cause of respiratory failure. So the use of low molecular heparin will be uh, uh, the first choice after the thrombolysis. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Prof. Yeah. Uh, so the observation is such a, I, I did attend and uh, went through some of the Chinese consensus guideline from the pulmonologist as well as critical care. The summary is that if the COVID patients do become critical care patients, the management of DVT prophylaxis, VT prophylaxis is the same as any other sick case. The first choice is low molecular weight heparin. And uh, the caution is bleeding risk assessment, especially if they are actively bleeding or they have low plate count less than 50,000. Then I think you may want to dose adjust. Uh, there is an observation that there is higher rate of spontaneous venous and arterial thrombi formation in a sick COVID-19 patients, uh, especially if they have a prolonged ICU stay with ARDS. So I, I think a VTE prophylaxis uh, is useful. Uh, this part, I think, is evidence-free, whether there's a need to adjust the type of depth uh, during uh, active infection or not, I'm not too certain as well. I think it's based on the adjustment. Uh, Derek, you have a comment? Jack, there are, I suppose there are some options to think about in patients with platelet counts that are dropping. First one is um, you know, whether or not it is a HITS-related, an immune-related response, um, whether or not heparin might be making that worse in, in these patients. Um, and so depending on availability, um, direct thrombin inhibitors in, in Asia might be an option. Uh, I'm not sure of the availability of bilalirudin in, in Asia, but agatroban or, or lepirudin might be something that you think about. The second thing is that if, if you know, we're in a situation where we've just deployed a stent and um, we're uncertain about what's happening with the platelets, um, uh, you know, some centers have used short-term antiplatelet therapies um, obviously, um, uh, the, you know, the availability of tyrofiban um, um, and eptofibotida are um, less now, but potentially things to, to think about. Um, and for the moment, I've just forgotten the name of the intravenous uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, but I don't think that's available widely in Asia. Kangri Law, you mean? IV Kangri Law. Kangri Law, yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Lowe, maybe I can ask you, what's the mechanism for thrombocytopenia in COVID sick cases? Uh, I don't think it's been fully worked out yet. As uh, Professor Derek said, um, we, we, some, some people have noticed um, some raised D-dimers in those who have gotten a bit sick. Um, th those definitely, when you reach that range, some DIC could be, could be one of the positive mechanisms. Um, but the other thing is um, the thrombocytopenia, because you know we are from a dengue endemic country, it's not as severe as, as we, we fear. It's not like it doesn't go to double, low double digit or single digits like dengue. We, we see like 100 unexperienced, like probably a 90 lowest, 100. I don't know what's, maybe Professor Shikai from China. Have you seen really severe thrombocytopenia, like low 20 single digits? Usually it's quite mild, right? 100, in, in that 100, 110 range, right? Yeah, not, not so many. Not so, okay. Yeah, so looks like the thrombocytopenia, if I hear the consensus here, is not a huge concern unless the actively bleeding is rapidly plunging. Then there may be a concern about adjusting the DAPT therapy. Bear in mind that the observation is a lot of them, when they're sick, do have other either arterial or venal thrombotic uh, risks as well. So we need to be careful about down titrating, especially during active ACS. Dr. Mahmoud, uh, do you have any cases uh, that has a lot of thrombocytopenia in your care plan? No, I mean, uh... We've done a bunch of COVID cases and no, no, no significant thrombocytopenia. But we had some delays, interestingly. There's always this question about this myocarditis. We've had a few that we initially treated as myocarditis that ended up having significant coronary disease and then delayed an, an intervention. So it's always a tough, yeah, it's tough. balance it's, on deciding on when to take these more stable. You can go either way. You can thrombolize someone with normal coronaries as well. So I think it goes... It cuts both ways. Uh, Derek, you have a comment just now? No, I was just noting somebody on the chat board had a, an interest that I, I think an important contribution, and that was that if you're worried about thrombocytopenia, it might be reasonable to take the patient to the cath lab, but 
to take balloon angioplasty only, not deploy a stent, but just to kind of get balloon reperfusion. Uh, unfortunately, it's a good strategy. The only problem is that if you're stuck in the situation of not being able to maintain flow and needing to stent um, that in that situation, but nevertheless, not a, not a bad idea to try and at least get reperfusion in that situation. So, so I think I just quickly summarize before I move to Dr. Lowe's point. I think there is, in the first presentation I made and Dr. Shikai's observation, what we're doing and we're trying to do is based on resource limitation, right? So if resource is not limited, we should still try as much as possible to follow guideline mandated therapy. I think we do know that in the suspect or uh, uh, likely STEMI case, the best therapy that we have currently is a stent or acute uh, PCI. And we should try to deliver it if it doesn't increase the risk for our healthcare workers. Um, I think that is the discussion we're having here. And deviating from therapy is always with a caution, I would say. And I think luckily we don't see that much of uh, severe thrombocytopenia, but we do see an increased risk of VTE if they are sick enough to go to the ICU. So I think some form of the VTE prophylaxis is still useful. Titrating in combination with that will gauge the bleeding risk for this group of patients. So again, individualized. With that, I would like to move on to Dr. Lowe's uh, quick uh, state-of-the-art run-through about the current status of COVID-19 pharmacotherapy. What is out there, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, maybe our ID physician can enlighten the cardiologist across the region. Then we can have a quick discussion on that. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lowe. Okay. Uh, thank thank you, Jack. Um, thanks for inviting me. Hello, everybody. I'm Jia Shen from Sengkang. Uh -huh. So um, let me just share my screen. screen. Right, I'll just go to the. Okay, okay. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay. I'll put up a slide. All right. Okay. You can see, right? Okay. So, um, so I'll just give a quick review of what's being used here. Um, as, as you know, um, I think being a cardio, cardio uh, talk, I think the most important is the relation of new drugs to cardiovascular drugs, right? So earlier in the outbreak, there, there are talks about angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and ARBs worsening the disease, worsening uh, the presentation. I think that has not uh, pan out in trials and observation. So um, the, the guideline now is if a patient is on antiplatelet, statin, ACE inhibitor, ARB, they are just to carry on as per uh, cardiovascular indications. Yeah. So we can get it out of the way. Okay. Number two, one of the things that we, we have to be mindful of is that one of the trial drugs, Calitra, has many interactions. So one of the main interactions are with uh, statin. So Calitra increases a Tova statin concentration, Simba statin concentration, and also Rosuva statin. So what, what it does is it can possibly cause increased myalgia and increased myositis. So there's one point to take note of. So, but the other one that's quite um, alarming is that Calitra can decrease the drug levels of the active metabolite of ticagrelor. So if you're using ticagrelor to prevent stent thrombosis, it can actually render it um, ineffective. So that's another thing to, to be mindful of. So as long as the word Calitra doesn't pop up in the management of a patient, it's, it's probably fine. Okay, so moving on. Um, over the last three months, there have been guidelines coming out from everywhere, right? So on the top left is our Singapore guideline, and the top right is the American Thoracic Society guideline, and the bottom is the idea is American Infectious Disease Society guideline. And you can see there's seven recommendations. All of them are to recommend things in the context of a clinical trial. So this guideline is like a trial enrollment guideline. They, it's, they're unsure about anything. And this is quite recent, right? So if you were to look at... Um, the current uh, research landscape, everything is comparing your standard of care. So this is just like a brief overview. And if everything is comparing your standard of care, we do, at this point don't really have a drug that, that is proven to work. If it is, then everything will be compared to that drug. That drug will be the new standard of care. So, um, so to quickly run through, when we evaluate a new drug, uh, this is sort of uh, the mind map, right? The antiviral drug must first be proven to be able to reduce the viral titus. In, in anyway, either in, in, in mice model, animal model, human model, you must be able to reduce the virus titer, and then and then there can be a biological possibility to improve mortality, right? And if you go down, 
Of course, the patient wouldn't care about reducing viral titer. The patient will care about mortality. But, um, but as you go down the, the blue bars, the size, the effect size of the intervention diminishes because so many things can affect mortality, right? When they go into ICU. So it's hard to say one single drug can change the course of things, yeah. So quickly moving forward, um, from our previous SARS-1 and MERS-CoV experience, these are some of the drug targets that have uh, come to pass. Right? So I organized my talk as uh, the virus uh, does this uh, route of attack outside in, yeah. So over in Singapore, we have mainly have more experience with hydroxychloroquine, uh, Kalitra, which is the combination drug, uh, HIV drug, lopinavir and ritonavir, and remdesivir, right? So, so hydroxychloroquine shows uh, good in vitro activity. And because hydroxychloroquine is so much safer than chloroquine, people have gravitated towards using hydroxychloroquine. And chloroquine has not been used much in Singapore. And this uh, dose ranging study finds uh, equivalence between 400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine is equivalent to 3,000, 3 grams of chloroquine. And uh, the side effect profile of hydroxychloroquine is much better. And if you can see here, the EC50 at 24 hours, 23. This, is, this column is the hydroxychloroquine column and extreme right column is the, uh, sorry, sorry. The middle column is a chloroquine column. The extreme right is hydroxychloroquine column. Such a low dose, 6.14 is equivalent to 23.9. So, um, so this famous trial from uh, France that randomized people into control, which is the black line, hydroxychloroquine only, which is the blue line, and hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin only, a uh, combination, which is a green line, showed decrease in percentage of patients with PCR-positive samples in a respiratory sputum. So this, this came very early. This came very early, but uh, this trial was uh, subsequently commented to be full of methodological errors, yeah? So one of them is it's a very small group, right? It's a very small uh, trial, number in the tens of 36 people, 26 in the HCQ arm and 16 in control. Um, one of the good things about this trial is they recruited, they started drug very fast. They started the drug very fast and they were able to show an effect. However, look at this, in the dropout, three patients are transferred to ICU, one patient died, and these are reasons for lost to follow up. So they didn't include these people in the analysis. So I thought if somebody transfers to ICU or die, they should be part of the analysis, but they, they weren't included. So I thought um, it's not so impressive. Yeah. So, so subsequently in China, they did the same trial, but this is a much bigger trial, much larger numbers. They um, randomized to 75 in each arm, hydroxychloroquine and standard care versus standard care alone. Um, it's randomized at day 16. So the difficulty to interpret this trial is the patient started hydroxychloroquine very late. And this would be a consistent trend in all drug trials in this outbreak. And at, in this trial, it is shown that the viral clearance and the clinical improvement didn't change for, for both arms. So it's, it's a negative trial, right? It's preprint data, it's pending peer review, right? So um, hydroxychloroquine uh, sort of lost its appeal because of uh, a lot of trials like that. So moving forward, we have uh, Kalitra, same thing, NEGM study, case 999, control 100. So about 100 versus 100. And all these patients were quite, uh, they're not so well. They all required um, oxygen therapy. The inclusion criteria is people with SpO2 94% on room air or PF ratio of less than 300, right? Um, so the primary outcome is a, a two-point improvement on this seven-point scale. Seven points in number seven is death, number one is uh, not discharged or not hospitalized. So, um, so a two point improvement from this scale, say for example, from five to three is considered improvement, and the time to improvement is the primary outcome. And as a result, there's no difference, it's 16 days versus 16 days to time of improvement, right? But then again, the median time of administration in this trial is 13 days from onset. And if you look at the mortality difference, Kalitra versus standard. It's 19% mortality for Kalitra and 25%. That's a very, very high number. So this trial really went for the sickest patients. Yeah. So uh, a 25% mortality. So it's hard to say that this drug has no effect because they went for the sickest patient and the CI almost crosses zero. So it's negative 17.3 to 5.7.
So we don't know yet. We don't have a trial for Kali trial where it's given early. Yeah. So however, uh, the, China's, uh, the Chinese uh, have this trial with 35 on Kali trial, 35 on Arbido and 17 on placebo. Negative trial. So viral clearance on day 7 and day 14, no difference. The fervescence, improvement in cough, improvement in radiological features of pneumonia on CT chest. They, they couldn't find a difference. So, uh, but the problem with this trial is not blinded. Uh, so the patients sort of knew what they took. And Abidol um, is a RNA polymerase uh, inhibitor, a bit like uh, remdesivir, right? So how about, so this is the very famous drug that, that the whole world is, um, is, is eagerly anticipating, right? So this is the first trial that came out on NEJM and it showed um, in 53 people, and this is the group of patients they have, huh? 34 of them were on invasive ventilation, uh, 30 of them on invasive ventilation, four of them on ECMO even, um, 19 of them on non-invasive oxygen support. So quite, uh, quite a sick group of people, yeah? Uh, but what they showed was that uh, seven patients died right? That's 13% of the overall cohort. And that's 18% of people receiving invasive ventilation and 5% not receiving invasive ventilation. And if you compare this to the general cohort in a, in a normal pool, that wouldn't be so much better than a general pool. So this study, although it came out at NEJM, actually was flawed with methodological errors. And there have been various reviews uh, and, and letters written Number one, there's no control group, yeah? So this, is, this trial had no control group. You see it's published on the 10th of April. Um, by that time, there should be no lack of patients for a control group. Um, the, the trial didn't say why they chose this six, 53 patients. Um, that, that was not given. And um, there was no predefined sample size, yeah? They didn't say they want to recruit up to this number. Um, so they just stopped recruiting and, and there's no clear indication why they stopped at 53, right? Um, so it's, it's very difficult to, to draw any conclusion. At most, we can say this drug was safe because there's not so many side effects from this. So, um, in, of course, in China, they, there's another big trial with 237 patients. This one randomly assigned two to one to remdesivir or placebo across 10 hospitals. Um, but the good news is they couldn't finish recruiting. And that's because the outbreak stopped in Wuhan. It stopped so fast they couldn't finish recruiting. So they only managed 237 patients. Um, but the primary outcome is also time to improvement as defined by a two-point improvement to a similar scale as the one I showed before. But there are eight secondary outcomes. There are eight. So uh, but what did they find? Um, this, is, this is how severe the group of cohort is. Everybody started like around day 11 or day 10, okay, on top. Um, if you look at highest oxygen therapy, about 9% to 4% of each arm are in, on non-invasive. Um, very few people on ECMO and 7% on each arm on invasive, right? But the strange thing about this study um, is that there's a large proportion of them on steroid. If you were to look at a corticosteroid arm, uh, 65 and 68%. And steroids is actually not uh, a standard of care medication in COVID-19. So we, we, we don't really know why such a large proportion of them are on steroids, right? So, um, and, num and they're treated for steroids for quite a number of days. Uh, sorry, Jason. Um, I, I think it's, it's very comprehensive, your review, but in interest of time, can I get you to maybe I'll highlight go to the important conclusion slide? slide. Uh, All right. Okay. So this is a negative trial. Everything um, have been positive trial in earlier trials have been able to give that the, their antiviral early in cell sample and in animals. But in humans, trials, they couldn't, couldn't get it, right? To, to give the drugs early. So, and this is the eagerly anticipated trial. We don't know the result yet. This is the latest one. This is randomized control. So we don't have the, the, the data yet. There's a possible survival benefit. The P approaches uh, significance, but the main selling point is improved recovery time. This is the one that, that made Juliet so famous in, in the last week. So, uh, Tocilizumab, that's the other thing we do. Um, and this is actually not antivirus, it's anti-inflammatory. It, it's born out of uh, understanding that L6 uh, levels goes up in the second week and the, D and the ferritin level goes up. Many descriptive study, none of them control, right? So it is also not yet standard of care. 
So I just jumped to the conclusion, number one, no antiviral drugs are currently proven to work, right? The main motivation of large number of off-label drug uses because they are very safe. Most of them are very safe. Hydroxychloroquine uh, is very safe. Kalitra, we have a lot of experience in HIV patients previously. For short term, it's, it's, not, it's not much side effect. The evidence base is sufficiently lacking at this point that a no antiviral treatment position and pure supportive measure is still defensible. So you can still treat a patient without antiviral and still be, uh, be in a defensible position. Therapeutic effect of any trial will require very early administration. This is very difficult to replicate. Combination trials are underway and endpoints has to be rigorously and honestly looked at. And mortality must be number one. Number two would be decrease in turning sick to require ICU resources. Um, so number seven, most patients recover from supportive treatment. Even if you have a drug, tr drug that is supposed to work, who do you use it on? It's the next challenge to answer, right? Okay, so today I conclude my slide. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. That was very quick and fast. Uh, and I, I think I learned a lot from that. Uh, Professor Shikai, what, what, what worked or what didn't work in China in your experience? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, from the very beginning, we, uh, the Chinese uh, physician tried uh, several kinds of uh, medicine to treat this, uh, uh, those patients. Just as uh, Professor, Professor Lowe said, so far, we have no, no single medicine, so very good result. So I have, have, we have to wait. But for me, I think the, just like the coronary disease, the prevention, I think the first uh, choice to, to save the patient's life. Prevention as in preventing infection, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, preventing infection. Preventing infection. Like what was done very well in uh, Vietnam uh, so far, I would say. Um, so um, I think we'll come to the, just past the one hour mark. I'd like to call for last words uh, from my faculty before I quickly summarize. Uh, Professor Koji, any last teaching point from you? Very much. I, I think uh, prevention is very important and also the preventing the worsening of uh, COVID-19 patients is very important. So antiviral drug maybe uh, should be uh, administered as early as possible uh, after uh, uh, the diagnosis of COVID-19. So we need to establish the uh, establish uh, uh, checking the COVID-19 uh, by simple uh, test uh, like influenza, and then administer the antiviral agency as soon as possible. That was it for. And also the second thing, uh, the COVID-19 is a very common, uh, and even uh, though we, uh, the patient have no symptom at all, uh, uh, there is a report 6% of patients were positive uh, for PCR. So I think that the COVID-19 becomes uh, more and more common disease. So we need to perform the screening of the PCR before the usual elective PCI or usual uh, elective surgery. Yeah. Thank so you that, that may become really the norm, um, serology test. I don't know where that is going, but maybe all patients coming to the cath lab will have HIV, Hep B, and COVID-19 uh, IgG uh, titers checked before they come in. Uh, Jason, you have any comments on that, serology? Are we uh, going yeah, there? people are talking about serology passport. Um, yeah, but if you're positive, it doesn't say when you have it. You, you could be still transmitting now, but uh, <laughs> recent, uh, recently a study from Germany says actually the transmission period is not as long as the period of PCR positivity in the sputum. So you may be PCR positive by, by a throat or nasopharyngeal swab which can last up to 30 days or more, but actually these are non-viable scraps of virus, you know? So as the outbreak goes on, we may learn more and realize that the viability and transmissibility really drops after 14 days. That's the feeling I'm getting, looking forward. Okay, a any other comments from the faculty? Yeah, Alan, you're muted. Sorry, Alan. Yeah, thanks, Jack. I, I just thought that, that from institution perspective, the usage of all these new antiviral drugs and treatment for COVID-19 does play an impact on many of our cardiology patients because they are in polypharmacy. 
but from the pharmacotherapy perspective, we should be watching out for all these uh, adverse events, uh, notwithstanding the QT uh, prolongation issues. Uh, but from the acute uh, STEMI perspective, um, I'd just like to drop uh, this thing which you've been using. What's that? Uh, you watch that? That's, uh, that's, that's the nectar place. Okay, so I, I, I don't know how to spell thrombolysis as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, we, we still don't have enough. I mean, uh, the, whole of, uh, the whole month of, um, uh, of April, we've only had about 10 cases for STEMI at our institution. So that's uh, about 50% of our caseload. So I think uh, we should also be vigilant to look out for these cases and to uh, remind patients that our heart centers are still open. <laughs> uh, they, they shouldn't uh, think that they got chest pain and think it's all, all gastritis, you see, and then they drop dead before they come in. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah so that, that's uh, worrisome. A any other comments from the faculty? Any last uh, words? You know, I'd like to quickly just uh, summarize and thank uh, my participants and particularly the faculty for their invaluable contribution. I'd like to just quickly summarize backwards on the last talk uh, from what I learned. What I learned is that so far, I'm still not convinced that anything works. I'm not convinced we're going to get a vaccine so soon. Uh, I don't know what to do with serology tests and where to place this. I think this is still evolving. I was still trying to figure it out. So when I'm not too sure things work, we have to be careful when we give it though. Meaning we have to be careful about withdrawing ACE inhibitors without true evidence that it harms patient. We have to be careful about adjusting our anti regime when we know there's proven efficacy, but we don't know the downsides of changing and down titrating. We don't know, we do know now that uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, calitra probably all doesn't work. I'm not too sure whether when that's to be a work. We know convalescent plasma may or may not work. So I think standard of care, like what Professor Shikai said, preventing the infection, flattening the curve, identifying the sick cases early. If they need supplemental oxygen, prophylactic innovation, good practice, intensive care is what we save patients' life with. I think these are the standard therapy that we shouldn't forget. We are, I think, too engrossed in hunting for the silver lining um, magic bullet, which I think will not come so soon. Cutting the second talk about uh, Derek's uh, APSC consensus, I think like all consensus or guidelines, you have to be individualized and titrated for the patient depends on the severity of sickness and their bleeding risk. I think you have to constantly adjust the therapy based on patient, but the feedback is that I think the guideline is there for a reason. We shouldn't deviate too much from guideline in treating our ACS patient, especially the proven ACS patient. They can still drop dead and die from ACS, just uh, remind everyone. We do have an observation across the region and totally that the attendance for ACS has dropped, whether for STEMI or NSTEMI. We're not too sure why. Maybe patients are telling themselves it's gastritis not coming in. Maybe the instance is dropping. Maybe medical therapy works well. I, I'm not too sure of the reason. We can only retrospectively know whether mortality across this period in all countries has gone up when people do not attend for ACS. I'm not sure. So we'll wait to see uh, those data. Um, coming from Professor Shikai's talk, I think uh, the Chinese have a lot of experience and their consensus guideline for best practices looks like very difficult to reach for a lot of countries, whether it's a segregated hospital care, uh, resource allocation. I don't think we can send 40,000 healthcare worker to my side of town to help out with management. So I think China does have a lot of uh, fast reaction for lockdown as well as uh, truncation and allocation of resources. The, I hope that I have a negative care flap, negative pressure care flap, but I don't think I'm going to get it. But I, it's reassuring to hear that uh, for patients, some workflow adjustment, mitigation of risk does help even with a positive pressure care flag. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating and staying for the one hour mark. For those who have stayed for one hour, you get a CME point. I see a lot of Q&A. A lot of my Singapore participants are more concerned about the CME point. They're asking questions. You'll get a CME point, don't worry. So I, I think education continues. I'm glad that uh, APSC continues to embark on this series of webinar so that we can still have some form of information exchange and education during this difficult COVID period. So I wish everyone the best and uh, keep safe, please. And we continue this information exchange. With that, uh, thank you very much.
and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you bye. very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Jack. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.